ready to open your word. I pray, Lord, that we would indeed hear from you. As we open your word, Lord, may our hearts and minds be open to you. And Lord, we lift up the ladies at the women's retreat that you would guide and encourage and minister to them. Lord, that you would speak through Jane in a special way that would bring encouragement and direction and strength in the faith and the lives of each person there. Lord, we pray for our children's ministry that you would be with each person who is uh, teaching our children. That, Lord, as they hear the lessons from your word, they would see and hear you, Lord Jesus, and be drawn to trust you as their personal Savior and Lord. And I pray the same for this morning, Lord, as we hear your word and we hear your voice speak to us. Lord, wherever our hearts are at this morning, whether near or far, I pray draw us home to you. Draw us close to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I want to spend some time with you this morning being very real. Not that we're not real, but I want to be very real with you this morning. Some time ago, someone offered me a book. At first, when they offered the book, I thought, you know, I don't, I don't really need another book. I've got too many books. And then when I saw the title of the book, I immediately was interested. The title is Loving God When You Don't Love the Church. The title leapt off the page and I had to read this book. Later on that evening, I opened up the first chapter and began to read. And the author did not waste any time getting to the point, telling it like it is. He said this. He said that we're all like a woman at the well. We're looking for life. We're carrying a thirst that cannot be satisfied. We know that we're destined for more than the way we're living. So we set out in search of real life. We go to the only place we know to try and draw living water. We go to church. What do we find there? Not what we expected. And then he confesses, you know, I have mixed feelings as I write this because I've seen so many contradictory things in church. He says, I love the church, but I hate certain parts of it. I adore the people of God, but I've also been hurt so deeply that some of them that uh, from some of them that have almost lost my faith. In church, I've met some of the sweetest saints to ever grace this planet, but have also been lied about and slandered behind my back. I've experienced true covenant friendship in church, but have also experienced the Judas kiss in church, and I've encountered God in church, but have also been nearly killed by religion. I've tasted the presence of that's brought me life, but have also been suffocated by legalism and control. I love God. But for a while I wanted to say, forget the church. Throughout history, the church has been one of the greatest change agents of mercy that the world has ever seen. The church is the bride of Christ, and He loves her passionately, and I love her too. Thus, my mixed feelings... For as wonderful as she is, the body of Christ is filled with wounded sons and daughters who come to church looking for life, but were disappointed. Instead, they encountered a religious system that left them lying on the road to Jericho, right beside the man in Jesus' story. Instead of meeting good Samaritans who would tend their wounds and bear their burdens, they were left to bleed to the pious as pious worshipers looked the other way. I am being overly, am I being overly dramatic, he says, and critical? I probably am. I know that there are incredible people in church who lay their lives down for hurting humanity. It's just that I too have lain in the ditch of despair and was shocked to see that hundreds and thousands of Christians were lying right beside me. And then he says this, just about the time I was about to point a righteous finger at this hypocritical element in church, 
it dawns on me. I am the church. I am the church. You ever felt that way? Can you relate to his words? I hesitated in sharing this with you this morning because this is so down-to-earth, nitty-gritty real, isn't it? And yet, as I prayed about it and I thought about it, you know, this really says it all, doesn't it? We love God's church. We've given our life to Christ. But the reality is, in this side of eternity, we live in a world that has fallen, and whether we like it or not, we still are hurting people, and we still hurt people. Unless we have the grace of Christ to move forward, to find healing, we'll be no different than the world, will we? I think if I could put a, a name to the prevailing attitude that I see in today's culture that it suffers from more than anything else when it comes to God or it comes to the Bible or Christianity, this is among believers as well as unbelievers. I think this prevailing attitude, the name of it, would be cynicism. Cynicism begins with a, a negative attitude and slowly hardens over time to become a settled personality trait. And I've noticed that cynicism is highly contagious and extremely addictive. You know how I know that? Just spend any amount of time with someone who is a seasoned addict of cynicism, and you'll see what I mean. You see, the truth of us, none of us are immune to cynicism, are we? All of us sometimes can adopt negative attitudes that will cause us to spiral downward in our walk with God, in our relationship with the church, in our relationship with others. Cynicism, I think, is the prevailing attitude that I see at work in many people's lives today. Let's face it, life hurts sometimes, doesn't it? Sometimes our faith sours, things happen to us, the troubles of life seem to mount up until it seems like there's no end in sight, and it's easy to be tempted to fall in to the trap of cynicism and the growing ranks of enthusiastic cynics. But let me ask you a question. I want you to take your notes out. In the top of your notes there, there's a little question on the very top. Would you go ahead and take your notes out? And I want to begin by asking this question. This is all very, very important for us. What is the opposite of cynicism? What is the opposite of cynicism? It is joy. Joy. And when we talk about the, when we talk about the Bible, joy is that that inward conviction that God who is good, God who is loving, is in complete control of my life, and therefore I can have joy because I have a de determined attitude, a conviction in my faith that no matter how difficult or how sour things are on the outside, nonetheless I know God is in control, and thus I can have joy. Robert Louis Stevenson said this, to lose joy is to lose everything. Boy, I think he's right. I think he's right. Well, this morning we're going to begin a new series, a series that I want to walk through, going through the book of Psalms. How many of you enjoy reading the book of Psalms? Psalms I find in my own life when I'm struggling, when I'm wrestling, and I want to walk into the immediate presence of the comfort of God I open the book of Psalms. I find myself doing that a lot. Simply opening God's Word to the largest book, the central book of the entire Bible, 150 chapters. And I find in those words God's immediate presence and comfort and joy. I want to walk through a series this morning with you that I'm calling Rediscovering the God of All Comfort or Rediscovering the God of All Joy. You see, one of the first things you learn about that I so appreciate as you read the Psalms is Psalms are written by real people. They're written by real people who are going through real hurts. They're multifaceted <coughs> challenges and struggles and pressures in life. But they're all seeking one thing. They're all looking for the same thing. They're looking for the only one who can heal our deepest wounds 
who can meet our greatest needs and satisfy our highest joys. You see, it is not without reason that the Bible says that God is the wonderful counselor. He is the Prince of Peace. He is mighty God. He is the chief shepherd. He is the great physician. He is our wonderful Savior that all of the psalmists are looking for. And I suspect you and I are as well as we turn to God's Word with life's struggles looking for His help. Well, this morning I want to walk through this series. And I want to walk through beginning with Psalm 1. How many of you are familiar with Psalm 1? What a great place to begin, Psalm 1. As I began to wrestle through the Psalms, thinking through, okay, Lord, how do we speak to rediscovering the God of all comfort? And I came to Psalm 1. And the more I poured over it, the more I read it and studied it, the more I fall in love with this Psalm. And I believe this Psalm is going to come to life for you in a very powerful way this morning. Because this Psalm addresses two kinds of people. This Psalm is going to address, first of all, it says, how blessed is the man who does not. So it's going to address, first of all, this man who's blessed. We'll look at that in a moment. What does that mean to be blessed? How blessed is the man? But there's a second kind of person that this psalm addresses. He describes them in several ways. The wicked, the sinners, the scoffers. In one word, they are the cynics of today's world. So on one hand, you have those how blessed are those who, those who follow God, and on the other hand, you have the cynics, those who are not following God. It's going to address these two kinds of people. As I read through the psalm, I think you're going to see both of these surface in the words of the psalmist. Then no one knows who wrote Psalm 1, but my guess is that David wrote it. But I want you to listen to these words, Psalm 1. As we slowly read through, I want you to listen for the two kinds of people that this psalm addresses. And I want you to listen to not just the kinds of people, but hear the benefits or the results of the choices they make in their lives. Someone says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of the sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked, he says, are not so. But they are like chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Did you catch the two kinds of people that he's talking about? Do you see the resultant differences of the choices they make in their lives? I want to kind of unpack this psalm today because it really talks about two kinds of people. It tells us two very important things. It's going to, first of all, tell us some facts about the cynic, the scoffer, the ungodly, the wicked, the sinner. It's going to tell us some facts about them that are just plain facts. We're going to look at three of them. Second, it's going to show us how do we find our way back to lasting joy. You see, I suspect that all of us have fallen into the trap of cynicism at one time or another. Am I not right? Or am I the only one? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> so how do we find our way back to lasting joy? If joy is the inward conviction that God is in control, that He is good, He is loving, and I know that He is in control of my life, and I can have joy as a result of that, that is the only antidote to cynicism, then how do we recapture that in our lives? This psalm is going to answer that question for us. But first of all, it's going to tell us three facts about cynicism. And those three facts are simply this. One is that it always, always will lead you into a trap. Cynicism will always lead you into a dead-end trap. Second, it's going to leave us insecure. Third, cynicism always lies to us about the future. Well, first of all, 
it leads us into a trap. Verse 1 says this, How blessed is the man who does not walk in the way or in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Notice that he says, How blessed is the man who does not. He begins, first of all, describing what a blessed man is not. Look at the word blessed right there, would you? That word blessed there is not a casual meaning like, oh, how, how generally happy the person is who does not do these things. But rather, this word for blessed here has the idea of being supremely happy, fulfilled in life. And he's saying simply this, that the person who is supremely happy or fulfilled in life has made a choice. He's made a conscientious, deliberate choice of where he is going in life. How blessed is the man who does not, and listen to the progression of thought that the psalmist gives, who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the path of sinners, does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Do you notice the progression there? He does not walk, he does not stand, does not sit. There's a progression, a downward spiral of cynicism at work here that he's talking about. And he's saying that the man who is supremely happy, who is fulfilled in life, has made a very deliberate choice as he looks at the world and the host of choices that he can make about which way he's going to go in life. He sees the path or the way of the wicked and says, no, I'm not going to do that. He sees that following the counsel of the wicked or standing in the path of sinners or sitting in the seat of scoffers is a downward spiral that leads into the trap of cynicism. They go from bad to worse. By the way, you ever want to read one of the greatest essays on cynicism in the Bible? All you have to do is read the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, who was the wisest king in the world, was also the world's worst critic. He struggled with cynicism probably more than anyone. Just listen to his words. Everything he says is meaningless, completely meaningless. See, what Solomon was going through at this point in his life was called a midlife crisis. As he looked at the world, he said, everything is meaningless, completely meaningless. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, chasing after the wind. Have you ever felt that way about life? Am I the only one? <laughs> Psalm is simply saying this, you know what? He is using what is called under the sun wisdom. He is looking at life without God and he's trying to make sense of it all. And when he does, he becomes the world's worst cynic. He was not simply the wisest king, but he was also the world's worst cynic because he was trying to make sense of life without God. And that's exactly what the cynic does. The cynic walks in the counsel of the wicked. The wicked here that he's talking about is not wicked in the worst sense of the word wicked, but rather it is a word that describes somebody who is ungodly. It is someone who has a casual, if not indifferent, interest in God. They can take God or leave God, but really they don't need God at all because they don't see a great need for Him at all. So he says, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The wicked are those who simply say, you know what, I don't have any time for God. I don't see any great need in my life for God. I can take Him or leave Him, but you know what, I'd rather just leave Him. So they see no real need for God. This is a person that we all recognize because we've been this person, where we say, you know what, I'm living for me. I'm number one. What I want in life is what I want in life. I'm going to go where I want to go in life and do what I want to do in life. Have you ever met somebody like that? You looked at him in the mirror this morning and you got up. <laughs> and so the author is simply saying this, that the person who is ungodly, that is, who walks in the counsel of the wicked, is somebody who says, you know what, I can take God or leave God, but you know what, I really don't need God. And how many times have we seen somebody in their life who says, you know, I'm living for me, and they seem pretty successful at it. And that can be very appealing. Well, what he's saying is this, is that the moment you do that, just watch their lives, follow the course to the end, and you'll realize when they get to the end of their lives, they find that life is one big, fat, empty zero. Because they've lived for themselves for so long, they've lived ultimately for nothing. Second, he talks about those who stand in the path of sinners. 
Now, what you notice is the progressive uh, uh, thought that he's developing here. It's a downward spiral. If the ungodly, that is the wicked, have no time for God, they're indifferent to God, the sinner is somebody who doesn't simply casually reject God, but rather somebody who deliberately excludes God from their life completely. They want nothing to do with God in their values, in their thinking, in their conduct, in their morals. They don't want God at all. And they make a deliberate choice. So he says, How oh, blesses the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the path of the sinners. Then he describes a third kind of person. He describes those who sit in the seat of the scoffers. Do you see the progression? Walking, standing, sitting. Now the scoffer here is not simply someone who has not only casually rejected God, but has deliberately excluded God from their life, but they've taken it one step further. The scoffer is the person who sits in judgment of, of, of God, who mocks God, who questions God's ways. The scoffer is the person who blames God for all the things that are wrong in their life and the world around them. And they've made a settled determination not only to avoid God, but to blame God in their lives for all of the world's problems. Do you know what he's talking about here? He is talking about somebody who is virtually a practic practical atheist. He says, you know, I really don't need God. I don't know if God is or isn't. I really don't care if He is or isn't, but I really don't need God. That's what you call a practical atheist. And the psalmist says, blessed is the man, supremely happy is the man who makes the choice not to walk in that path. He recognizes that cynicism is a self-deluding, dead-end trap. That happiness is never found when you try to live life without God. You see, atheists have one major problem in their life. Well, actually, they have numerous problems. But they have one major problem. They either believe that God doesn't exist or God doesn't matter. And if that's the case, then they have one major problem. That is that they have no reason for their own existence. That life and the world around them is nothing more than the product of meaningless chance. Like Solomon, they're using under the sun wisdom, trying to make sense of life without God. And so they're destined to become cynics or practical atheists. I read about a conversation once that Pastor Stuart Briscoe, well-known pastor from England who came to the United States years ago, had a conversation with a young man who was an atheist, or at least he claimed to be an atheist. And Briscoe asked him, he said, are you alive? To which the young man startled, he said, yes. So Briscoe said, well, why are you alive? <laughs> he said, because I was born and I haven't died. <clears throat> Did you have anything to do with your birth, he asked him. No, except that I was there. Well, do you plan on having anything to do with your death, he asked him. No. So then he said, well then as far as you're concerned, your birth was an accident and your death will be an accident. To which the young man then said, I suppose you're right. Then Briscoe said this, that I know what you are. He said, you are an accident suspended between accidents. The young man looked at him thoughtfully for a moment and then said, you know something? That helps me understand myself better than anything I've ever heard. <laughs> You are an accident suspended between accidents when you reject God. You are left with the burden of trying to explain what is the purpose, what is the meaning of life. You see, when you exclude God from your life, and I'm not talking about deliberately saying I don't need God or believe in God. I'm talking about when you live as a practical atheist, you don't bring your decisions, you don't bring your heart, you don't bring your life before God. So you know what? Uh, I, I'm going to live for God. I want to know what He thinks. I want to know what He wants me to do. When you exclude God from your daily, moment-by-moment -moment life, you live as a practical atheist, you're destined to become a cynic because you're trying to exercise wisdom that is under the sun. You're trying to live your life without God. 
cynics have a major dilemma. Because what they try to do is they try to make sense of life. And when they can't, what they do is they fill their lives with all kinds of things to try and silence the concern that life doesn't make sense. Life is one big fat empty zero. And so they try to fill it with all kinds of things until they finally, ultimately, hopefully, come to God. So first of all, the psalmist says this, that the, that the path of the cynic ends in a dead end. It's a trap. Second, it leaves us secure. Verse 4 says this. He says, now the wicked, that is the ungodly, those who are rejecting God, he says, they are like chaff that is driven away by the wind. He's using an agricultural term here, isn't he? And he says, they're like chaff, that is that husk that is empty, void of the seed, the straw, the, uh, the, the leftover, the shell of where there once was a seed, the grain has been removed. He says, he says that's what they're like. They're easily blown away, swept away by the wind. And he says, those who are ungodly, they reject God. He says, that's what they're like. They're easily driven away by the constant shifting of winds of opinion and adversity. When it comes to God's word, they really don't care. Because it doesn't make any sense to them. Why would I follow God? You see, in the wicked mind or the ungodly mind, to follow God makes no sense at all. Why? Because the world will tell you if you become a Christian, if you follow God, you're going to say no to all the fun in life. God, religion, Christianity, following Him is boring. Now, how many of you, let me just ask you a question. If you've been a believer for very long and you've seriously committed your life to following Christ, would you say that following Jesus has been boring? Far from it. But would you say that it has been nothing but a disappointment? Not at all. Following Christ is the most fulfilling, the most amazing relationship you'll ever have in your life. Does that mean you won't have troubles or struggles? Oh no, you will. But you'll never be alone in those troubles or their struggles ever again. Amen. And you have Christ to be the great shepherd in your life. And you're never, ever alone. We say that those who reject God are like chaff. They're blown away by the change of opinion or adversity in life. Because they believe that if you follow God, you're going to miss out on all the fun in life. You know, they're no different than where Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. Do you remember what the serpent said to Eve? Let me translate for you in paraphrase if I don't take it too far out of the boundaries. Satan basically said to Eve, he said, you know what? God is holding back from you. Real life, real fun. And if you really want to know what real life is like, then eat of this fruit that God has told you to eat of because God's really holding back from you. So what happened when, the Satan, when Satan said to Eve, if you eat this forbidden fruit, you'll be like God? What actually happened? She didn't become like God. She became like the devil. And her eyes were open. And she saw things that she did not want to see. Adam saw things he did not want to see. But what was their life marked by after that event? It was marked by insecurity. They'd gone from living a life of security and peace and strength in the Garden of Eden. But the moment they rejected God and revolted against Him, their lives were marked by by insecurity. That's what the author is saying here. He says, the wicked, that is those who are ungodly, that reject God, they are like chaff which the wind drives away. They're marked by insecurity. Not only are they going on a one-way path toward a trap, but their lives are marked by insecurity. Third, he says this, that the third fact of cynics is that it lies to them about the future. He says, therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor in the assembly of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. He's saying a couple of important things here. He's saying that those who reject God, that is, the wicked, will not stand in the judgment. They're not going to be able to withstand or survive the final judgment, nor will they be in the assembly of the righteous, he says. They are not going to know God's eternal bliss of heaven. So in other words, the cynic 
tells you just ignore the future. Don't worry about the future. It will take care of itself. How many of you have heard somebody say, you know what, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it? The cynic doesn't want to face the future because the cynic has no actual answer for the future. And that's what he's saying here, is that the person who rejects God has no answer for the future. And therefore, they will not be able to stand the judgment of God, nor be an assembly of God's eternal heaven. What they really want is this, is they want God to leave them alone. You ever heard somebody say that? You know, just leave me alone with your Christianity. I want to hear about Jesus. I want to hear about God. I'm fine without Him. You ever heard somebody say that? Maybe yourself. But what they really want is they want to be like Jonah. They say, God, leave me alone. I'm going to do my own thing. Just leave me alone. That is until Jonah was swallowed by the great fish and he felt actually abandoned by God. Then what did he think? He cried out, Oh God, where are you at? You see, the cynic says that he wants God to abandon him until he finally realizes what that means. The other day I was, I overheard a conversation of a man who, as I listened to him, I wasn't eavesdropping, but he was so loud I couldn't help but hear him. And he was talking about his life, and it seemed like he had a lot of good things going for him. But just like the rest of us, he was struggling with just life's everyday problems. That didn't catch my attention. What caught my attention is what he observed about the culmination of it all. He said, you know, one day, he said, I'll die and I'll just cease to exist. Like a candle that's blown out. Poof. And he'll be no more. And he says, you know, it won't matter anymore. Because I'll just cease to exist. It'll all be over. But the Bible says something very different. The Bible says that your body is going to die, but you are not going to die. That you're made to live forever. Your body's going to come to an end, but you're not going to come to an end. And you're going to live forever in one of two places. Either heaven or hell. Do you know that heaven is a real place? Sure you do. Do you know that hell is a real place as well? And that God puts before you and He puts for me a choice. Do we accept Christ and go to His eternal heaven? Turn from our sins and trust Him as our Savior? Or do we reject Christ and therefore have only the option of choosing hell? To be abandoned by God. You see, hell is simply that place of people who said, you know, God, I don't want anything to do with you. Just leave me alone, leave me alone, leave me alone. And God finally says, okay, I'm going to give you what you want. For all eternity. And they enter into a Christless eternity, knowing and feeling and experiencing God's ultimate and eternal abandonment because that's the choice they made. Can I ask you a question? Are you ready to die? I mean, are you really ready to die? Because the Bible says this, when we've trusted Christ, we are now prepared for death. When we've trusted Christ, not only can we, are we prepared for death, but now we can really live for the first time. I find it amazing, as I sat and listened to this gentleman have this conversation with another person next to him, I, I thought, isn't it amazing how somehow in our lives we go through this entire life, we never really give serious thought to the fact that one day, we're going to die. I mean, we kind of casually dismiss it, almost like this guy was, you know what, my life, it'll be over with, you don't have to worry about it, and we'll be done. But how different that is to talk about it than when I see people who are actually faced with their own mortality and realizing the devastating consequences that they're not ready to die. The Bible says the only way we can be prepared to die is to trust Christ. And that's important for us because cynicism lies to us about the future. It says, don't worry about it. You'll cross that bridge when you get to it. It's not a big deal. But the Bible says that we as believers, when we place our trust in Christ, we have ultimate joy. We no longer see death as a threat, as rejection from God, but now we see death as God bringing us home for the first time. 
That's what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Listen to what he says. Now we look forward with confidence to our heavenly bodies. We know that these things are true by believing, not by seeing. And we are not afraid, but quite content to die. For then we'll be at home with the Lord. He said, for believers, death is a promotion, isn't it? It's a graduation. We're home for the very first time. And the only way you can do that is by trusting Christ. So let me ask you a question then. Is there any hope for the cynic? Is there any hope for the cynic? Absolutely there's hope for the cynic. In fact, did you know that one of the twelve disciples was a cynic? His name was Thomas the Doubter. He was what is called the patron saint of the cynics. You ever questioned God or sat in judgment over God? I know you probably never have done that. You would admit it, anyhow, would you? But is there any hope for the cynics? Absolutely. God has a special love for the cynics. He loved Thomas. And he rescued him and brought healing to him. And I think in Thomas' life and the rest of Scripture, we see the secret to lasting joy. And that's what the psalmist is going to answer for us in the second part. But first of all, he says this, that the blessed is the man who does not. He's saying this, that if you want to live in supreme joy, supreme happiness, you need to realize there are some choices in front of you of where you're going to go. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, does not stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. Blessed is the person who wants to be supremely happy, that looks at the world around and says, you know what, I have a lot of choices, but I choose not to go the direction of those who reject God. That's what he's saying. But the second part of the psalm then talks about, okay, how do we avoid, how do we come back from being a cynic? How do we find lasting joy? And I would suggest to you the psalm gives us three very practical ways. One is to return to your first love, return to your first love in Christ. Second, reaffirm your trust in God's promises. And third, rest in God's assuring comfort. So first of all, I think it's return to your first love. Verse 2 says this, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Let me say that again. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. You see, the first step of recovering from cynicism is to return back to your first love in God. That's what he's talking about here. In the book of Revelation, God is speaking to the seven churches. And God says to the church of Ephesus, He says this, I have this complaint against you. You do not love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Then listen to what He says. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. You've lost your first love. Therefore, turn back to me and do the works you did at first. How do you do that? The psalmist says this, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Part of recovering joy back into our lives means we go back into God's Word, and we don't simply read it casually, but we read it slowly. We realize this is God's love letter to us personally, and we take the time not only to study it, but to meditate on it. Day and night, he says. That means to memorize God's Word. One of the greatest books you can memorize, or parts of it, would be the book of Psalms. What a tremendous source of meditating on God's Word, day and night. Can I ask you a question? Where are you at on a scale from 1 to 10? 10 being the greatest, 1 being the least. What would you say you're at in your love for God right now? What's getting in the way of that love being where you want it to be? Is there something in your life that you need to come before God and say, Lord, would you remove this? Would you show me how to get through this? Would you restore that love that I long to have for you first and foremost? 
the way back to joy is simply to say, you know what, I'm going to go back and do those very first things I did when I fell in love with God. I'm going to spend time in His Word. Spend time with Him, knowing who He is. You see, one of the distinguishing marks of a true believer is this. I've seen it time and time again. I experienced it in my own life. That there was a time in your life before you came to Christ that you looked at the Bible and you thought, you know what? It's the Bible. Big deal. But the moment you came to Christ, what happened? What happened when the Holy Spirit filled you in your heart and your mind? Suddenly you had this hunger, this thirst for God and His Word that you never had before. Why is that? Because you came into a relationship with God. And one of the first signs of a true believer's life is they recognize a love for Christ they never had before. Because this Savior has rescued them from a broken world and given them a new delight in both Him and His Word. The Apostle Paul talks about this. In Romans chapter 8 he says this. He says that the mind of the flesh is hostile toward God, that is the unbeliever. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. The difference between a believer and an unbeliever is a believer has a newfound delight in God and His Word. It is one of the earmarks of genuine belief. And I would ask you this. What is your love like for God's Word? I'm not saying become a bibliologist. You say, what is a bibliologist? What is a bibliologist? Somebody who worships the Word of God. That's a bibliologist. I'm talking about somebody who worships the God of the Word. How many of us have a delight for God's Word? If you don't, if you could take or leave God's Word, I would question, do you really know the Lord? Because you see, one of the first things that happens when you come to know Christ is you have a newfound love for Him and you want to know His will for your life. You want to know His Word. There's a hunger that comes from the Holy Spirit indwelling you to know who God is. There's a desire to know who God is. The second is this. is to reaffirm our trust in God's promises. So first of all, return to, to our first love. Second is to reaffirm our trust in His promises. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says, You will be like a tree, firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Nor, and whatever it does, He prospers. This is a rich and moving image that God uses throughout Scripture elsewhere, in Jeremiah and so on. And He says, This is what a believer's life is going to be like. When you decide to follow God and you full heartedly, full heartedly give it to Him, He says your life is going to be like a stately tree firmly planted by streams of water, strong and tall and stately, that you're going to yield fruit in its season, that your leaves will not wither. In other words, He's saying this, is that you're not going to be afraid of the droughts, the wind, the sun, the changing of season. Why? Because your roots are firmly tapped into the stream of living water, God Himself. And you're not worried about the changes that life brings. And you'll continue to produce fruit. And you'll prosper whatever you do. Because you're tapped into the living waters, God Himself. Years ago, there were a couple of missionaries, a missionary couple who had gone to China, and in their experience in China, they found this image to describe exactly what they went through. Their names were the Matthews, or their name was the Matthews, and when they were in China, they were there at the very end of World War II, when communism swept over the entire land. They found themselves trapped behind communism for two years. They were cut off from all Christian friends, all Christian contacts, because they didn't want to get them into trouble. All of their money was cut off, but, but for a short or a small trickle, the government had seized everything. They lived in a small room. The only furniture they had was a little stool. And the only source of heat they had was a little stove that they heated the room once a day, cooking the rice they would eat. 
and the fuel to run that stove came from dried animal feces that the father would go and find in the streets throughout the day. They spent two long years doing this, dry and difficult times. But afterward, they wrote a book called Green Leaf in Drought Times. And they shared with their readers how what they had gone through, they discovered that when you commit your way to the Lord, when you follow God, that even though the seasons may change around you of adversity, they found themselves to be strong and stately, continuing to produce fruit of godliness, irrespective of their circumstances around them. What they were doing was standing firm in the promises of God. How many promises, if you were just simply to think off the top of your mind right now, how many promises of God can you think of that you dwell on on a regular basis? Well, let me ask you this question. When you find yourself going through a difficulty or a struggle or a trial, how readily do you recall God's promises to address those struggles with? That's what he's talking about here. It's taking the roots of your life and tapping into the living waters so that you're strong, you're stately, you produce fruit, your leaf does not wither, you will prosper whatever you do. Why? Because you're tapped into God, you're respective of the adversities of life. And what he's saying here is to reaffirm your trust in God's promises. How do you find your way back to joy? You remove all the negative things that have been dwelling up in your mind, get rid of the weeds. And you reaffirm your trust in God's promises. Third, you do this. You rest in God's assuring comfort. He says this, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. This is how he ends this song. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. The word knows right there is not a casual like, Yeah, God knows who you are. He knows your social security number. But rather, this idea of know is that God is intimately aware of who you are. He knows everything about you, but it's more than simply a knowledge. The idea behind this word is that God has an abiding presence with you that will never leave you nor forsake you. That's pretty amazing when you think about it, isn't it? God knows who you are and He still keeps company with you. But this is saying that God more than simply knows you and keeps company with you, that God is in love with you and He has promised He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He knows everything going on in your life. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows where you're going. He knows what you're going to become. He knows your destiny. He knows who you are better than you know who you are. He knows that you belong, that you belong to Him. And so He says the Lord knows the way of the righteous. You see, resting in God ultimately means this. It's a choice of mind. It's saying, God, I know that you're in control. I know that you're good. And I know, Lord, that your word promises all things will happen for the good of those who love God and are called according to his promises. We know that if God is for us, who can be against us? We know that we're more than conquerors in Christ. We know that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. He said the person who has rediscovered joy is the person who has rested in the assurance that God is with him and God is good, even though life isn't always fun. Can I ask you a question? I'm sure you're asking a lot of questions in the aren't I? What are you going through in life right now that you're questioning God? What is it that you're facing that maybe you find yourself wandering down the path of a cynic, gaining counsel from the wicked, standing in the path of sinners, or even sitting in the seat of scoffers, sitting in judgment over God? The psalmist tells us, listen, that's a dead end. It will always leave you insecure. And it never promises what it offers. It always lies about the future. 
Because you see, whatever happiness the cynic has is never real or fulfilling because it's never based on something that is lasting or meaningful. So he says the key to finding lasting joy is to rest in God's assuring comfort that he knows. That's really what joy is. It's an inward conviction that God is good and God is in control, irrespective of what I'm facing. Let me wrap this up with an image that came to my mind as I thought through this message this week, and I thought, this is it. There is a well-known image in the Bible that I think describes our lives to a T. It is one that you know well, one that you probably grew up with, one that you thought about. It's the Ark of Noah. It's fascinating, when you read through Scripture, you'll find that when God gave Noah the plans to build the ark, it was explicit, wasn't it? He tells him what kind of wood to use. What kind of wood did he use? Go for wood. He tells him how long the ark was supposed to be, how wide the ark was supposed to be, how tall the ark was supposed to be. He gave him all of the plans he needed to, and every detail to build the ark. But it's interesting that when you read about all of God's explicit plans about the ark, that there are some very important things missing. Now, if you've ever been on a boat, you know that there are a couple of very important things that are essential to being on the water. A sail and a rudder. And the ark was intentionally built with neither. When God gave Noah all the plans for the ark, the two things that God forgot or the sail and the runner. And the more I thought about that, you know, that's exactly what our lives are like. God has put you in this world. You neither have sail nor rudder. You think you're in control. You direct the direction of your life. You're the rudder of your life. But you have neither. You are not in control of your life like you think you are. And what the psalmist is saying is this, is his, my life is like the ark. It neither has sail nor rudder. It is directionless in my own power. It is completely dependent upon God and His leading. What a powerful image of what it means to rest in the assuring comfort of God. Because you see, what we have is greater than neither rudder or sail. We have the assurance of God. Nothing could be more powerful, could it? So how do you find your way back to lasting joy? One is this. Is today, right now, you come before God and you say, Lord, would you renew my love for you? Would you restore that love to be genuine and remove anything that's getting in the way? Would you make your promises clear to me that I would memorize them and write them indelibly, not just on my mind, but my heart, as I face life's struggles and I look at life's issues. And I don't have answers under the sun for them, but I do have answers in the promises of your word for them. Lord, I'm going to rest and reaffirm in your promises. And third, Lord, there are things in my life that I don't know where it's going. I don't know what's going to happen. I have neither sail nor rudder to determine either. But I realize, Lord, I have something greater. I have you. That's what it means to rediscover the secret of lasting joy. Will you pray with me? With your heads bowed right now, would you make this moment between you and God. Would you come before Him in your heart of hearts? Would you say, Lord, I have to admit, Lord, I found the path of the cynic to be very tempting more than once. I found myself giving into a negative attitude that is hardened into a personality trait. And Lord, I don't want to go down this path.
Lord, I ask that you would restore that joy of who you are, the confidence of your assuring love, and sovereign control in my life, that my joy would be renewed. Forgive me, Lord, for looking around in life trying to make sense of happiness by my happenings. But instead, Lord, I pray, help me to resolve to make that decision irrespective of what's going on around me. I find a confident joy in the settled knowledge that you are in control. Thank you, Lord. Maybe you're here this morning, you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I ask you, are you prepared to die? The only way you can be prepared to die is to trust Christ, the one who conquered death and sin and overcame it, rising again the third day from the grave. When you are alive in Christ, death cannot touch you. Would you turn to him right now and say, Lord Jesus, I want to know and be prepared for death by trusting you. I give my life to you, Lord Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe you died in my place for my sins. And Lord, I know I need a Savior. I need a Prince of Peace. I need a wonderful counselor, mighty God, in my life. And I'm asking, Lord Jesus, would you be my Savior? I give you my life and ask, Lord, help me to know what it means to walk in you in that newfound delight of a love for you and your word. Fill my mind and fill my heart with your word to know your promises and to live them out with the confidence that you're in control. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray this in Jesus' strong name.